Well, Royal Ascot is here. The five best days of flat equine action coming to your screens or in person or here on irishracing.com. Uh, what a bonanza, what a spectacular it will be. And to discuss all things Royal Ascot related, I'm delighted to say I am joined by Stephen Harris, Johnny Ward and Emma Nagel. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, this promises to be absolutely brilliant. Uh, we'll come to you first, Emma. Um, it's a great time to get dressed up and enjoy the action. But I say, what a feast we've got on the actual turf itself this week. Yeah, it's an exciting one. Um, kind of, I suppose, the pinnacle of the flat season, really, uh, the, the, <laughs> the flats version of Cheltenham. So I've actually never been to Ascot. It's kind of one on the bucket list. Um, the whole right. the whole dressing up and everything adds adds to the whole atmosphere of it. And it's always, I love the kind of international aspect of Ascot as well. Kind of it always adds a bit to me. So I'm looking forward to seeing some of the Australian and American runners coming over as well. So, yeah, no, great week ahead. Yeah, absolutely. It, it will be indeed. And, and Johnny, uh, we don't get any kind of nonsense like the, the Presbury Cup at Royal Ascot. Uh, but in terms of the, the Irish hand here and the, and the kind of the Bally Doyle battalions, uh, do you see uh, the great Aidan O'Brien turning up here and mopping up a lot of these contests? Do you think he's perhaps got uh, more on his plate than some of these anti-post markets are suggesting? Yeah, I think, uh, Ed, with... Galileo kind of losing his influence a bit in recent years. Aiden has had to go around for different kind of sires. I don't think he has um, had a, the amount of sort of top class talent in recent years. You know, he hasn't had a great run in the classics in relative terms. But, you know, Royal Ascot, as Emma mentions, the international aspect. Willie Mullins is going to come over with a very mm -hmm. uh, strong team as well. And you look at Donald O'Brien, uh, Joseph O'Brien, Jessica Harrington. Uh, and then you bring in like the fact that you have Aussie sprinters coming over, American horses with Wesley Ward so well represented, despite the fact that British prize money obviously isn't that great. Um, and for me, it's a more international meeting than Cheltenham now. Um, I absolutely love it. And when you see that Nottingham was called off because it was waterlogged after the rain on Monday and Ascot has totally avoided that, we're probably a little bit mm. lucky that it's going to be good firm ground on day one. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of our, our resident uh, weather forecaster, Stephen Harris, you've got a, a glowing tan. You've clearly been sorting out the petunias uh, outside. But uh, as you say, it's going to be quick ground. It's going to be fantastic action. And uh, what, what's the particular highlights for, for the week from your point of view? Well, it's a bit. It's a big betting weekend. I mean, I do think it's it's very difficult, Royal Ascot. It's all different form lines uh, from around the world, from Ireland coming across, and you also got the fact this year it hasn't rained since April. Basically, they had about a millimetre yesterday. There is a chance of a shower on Tuesday, but that's it. So you're relying on the watering being fair and even across the track. I mean, one of the things I think it's important to do as a punter is to watch those early races on the straight course because. If there's any bias, it dramatically changes everything for the whole week. I mean, they're liable to be watering, I'd have thought, overnight most days as well to try and correct things, perhaps. So you have to start again the next day. But as a punter, that's something to really look out for. Yeah, indeed. Uh, that's something we'll come on to, no doubt, uh, in a bit more detail. The, the unknown dreaded draw bias. Um, which by the end of the meeting is still unknown to most people, even though we pretend we've all got it sussed uh, uh, when you're drawn on the wrong side in one of those six furlong sprints. Anyway, without further ado, we'll get into the action on the Tuesday to kick things off. Uh, it begins at 2.30 uh, with the Queen Anne Stakes Group 1 action here uh, for the four-year-olds and upwards. Uh, I think this is an absolute belter. 12 due to go to post, a bit of a who's who of top-level performers uh, in this encounter in spiral. And modern games uh, more or less vying for favoritism round two to one uh, native trail uh, six to one chindit 14s mustabek 18s uh, and then you into bigger prices the uh, the rest even you can lead us off with this i mean do you have a strong view are you in the inspiral camp the modern games camp or do you think they they could both potentially blow out and the, the value plays elsewhere well, it's a, this would be a fascinating market race, as so many of the races are at Royal Ascot. It's two to one each or two at the moment, which is one to two coupled. So there'll be plenty of bookmakers looking to get them both in and trying to chin them both. I do think they're well clear on form. I mean, instinctively, I think Inspire is a much better class um, than Modern Games. But Modern Games is fit, and Charlie Appleby's back in form. is probably going to get mm. a positive front-running ride, and he'll take plenty of passing. That's never a bad plan of attack on at Ascot on fast ground to be off the front and to keep finding. 
Um, the Tories obviously going to be very popular on Inspiral. Inspiral's a bit of a market horse. We haven't seen her for eight months. Um, on a day, she's top class. She's got an explosive turn of foot. I don't think you saw her the best on a final run last season, but she'll be fitting well. It's just how much confidence is behind her first time out. Uh, do you remember she got beat, didn't she? At sort of was it sort of seven to one on by Prosperous Voyage yeah, last? Sounds, it was like one of the mass yeah. biggest shocks of the whole season, wasn't it? But mm. I think she, when she's right, I think she's a better class than the, the, than the, her market rival. Um, it'll be fascinating to see. I haven't got a strong punting opinion. Be interesting to see the market tomorrow. Yeah, in, in fact, as you say that, just touching upon uh, that Charlie Appleby form, as you say, uh, in May, operated around 9.5%, which I think was his, his, yeah. his worst strike rate for about five years, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they are back, operating at around 34%, uh, back above his kind of average uh, for June. So very much all things back with the Charlie Appleby yard. Uh, Johnny, uh, any viewpoint on this? Is there an upset? Have you got a strong view? Is this one you're happy to sit out? It's a, it's a nicer race than last year, Ed, when, you know, you had a very short price favourite in the shape of Baid. And just as a kind of a reference point, Chindit was a moderate fourth in the race last year. And, you know, he's probably entitled actually to run quite well if you look at his lock inch form this year. But I'd be dead against in Spiral. I'm firmly of the opinion that she's not straightforward. Um, she, as... As we've seen, she's brilliant on her day at this meet last year. She was quite weak in the betting, but she put it all together with that blistering turn of foot under Frankie. But then, obviously, that performance um, at Newmarket was alarming. And then she plopped again at Ascot at the end of the season. So, basically, in two of her last three runs, she's disappointed. And if you look at modern games, um, his strike rate at the top level be it in grade ones or group ones, is extremely good. He was very, very good in the lock inch, and I think he's just really, really solid. I think, you know, as much as he's not a superstar like Boyd, he's to me, he's the most solid in the race. Look at Native Trail. He's had his win done. Again, was disappointing on his reappearance. We don't have any Irish runners at all in this race, so I think we can safely say it's staying at home, but um, I, I think, as you mentioned, the yards in form, modern games, rock solid. I really like the way he did in the lock inch, and uh, I'd readily have him over in spiral all day long. OK, one vote for Inspiral, one vote for Modern Games. Uh, Emma, where are you going? I'm probably just marginally on the side of Modern Games with this one, to be honest, but it's, it's a kind of a fascinating race. Um, like, I suppose the negative toward Inspiral is it's her seasonal debut, but kind of at the same time, I wouldn't be taking that too negatively when I'm thinking of her because I think she's probably best fresh. I think um, when she was at kind of at her worst at the end of last season was maybe when things were happening a bit too fast for her, you know, on Champions Day, maybe she was just going off the boil a bit. So I think she's probably at her best earlier on in the season. So, I mean, if she can get there in anything near her best kind of form, it's, it's going to be some renewal. But look, I just think Modern Games is just a lot more solid than her. She, like there's kind of a few question marks about her. Like Johnny said, she's not the most straightforward Frankels can be a bit like that sometimes. Um, so I'm just going to edge with modern games. I thought he was brilliant in the lock inch last time. Um, two of the last winners have come from the lock inch, Boyd and Palace Pier. So it's a tried and tested route. Look, he just he just looks so straightforward. Um, he looked real honest and kind of he puts his head down, he gallops away. So there's just kind of less that will put you off him than Inspiral, really. But I wouldn't have the strongest opinion, but I probably will edge with modern games if if uh, got gone to my head. Okay, well, I'm I'm firing in one at a price here. I'm on Berkshire Shadow. I've backed for Angie Boarding and Ashie Murphy. Uh, finished third in the aforementioned lock inch, only a couple of lengths behind Modern Games staying on. Does enjoy Ascot. Um, won the Coventry two years ago and wasn't beaten all that far in that blanket finish in St. James's Palace last season. Doesn't have a lot to find on ratings. And I'm just hoping return to Ascot could just eke out a couple of pounds improvement. So 33 to 1, that's my each way play uh, in the opener. Uh, onto the commentary at 3.05, River Tiber uh, heads the market here in what is a, a fascinating encounter. 22 runners due to go to the post, uh, as always is the nature of this group too. Uh, unexposed sorts, loads of unbeaten individuals coming in here. Uh, lots of guesswork in many respects. Uh, but Johnny, uh, River Tiber, uh, unbeaten two from two. Uh, cost 480,000 guineas as a yearling, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Ryan Moore on board uh, for Aidan O'Brien. Uh, this horse is pretty much kind of starting to get talked up as the uh, the Irish banker or one of them on the opening day. Uh, do you share that point of view? Yeah, Coolmore has... Um... I'd say Coolmore has three very interesting stallion prospects at the moment in the Derby winner, River Tiber and Paddington. And two of them, I don't think, have any sort of Galileo in them. So they can basically um, 
match with Galileo Mares, including River Tiber, and he is a stallion prospect because he's very quick, he's precocious, and he's very, very good. And you look at his form when he beat Taurus the last day, and the horse that was second, or that was third, I'm Invictus. They've both boosted the form since, and he was really, really strong at the finish. He's loads of pace, this horse. Aiden has won the Coventry three times in the years. Um, I think this horse is well up there. He's by Wood and Bassett, who obviously Coolmore have invested in. Um, but I am going to put him up as a saver to um, Asadna, and I have to tip uh, to Andy Holding here. Um, and we all know Andy's kind of um, speed references and all that, but he the, the, the performance that this horse first time out of Ripon was exceptional on the court on the clock it was so good that basically you know Andy was all over this horse straight away for the Coventry or whatever he was going to go for next so I'm going to back a Sadna in the sense of that um, you know he was so good in the clock his dad may mass very fast horse I think he was even second in this race um, and I'm going to have a small saver on on the favor as well and that might be very original the top two in the betting but I think we've two exceptional colds here yeah Sadna of course yeah uh, he smashed the clock to pieces at Ripon a 12 leg ease down winner. Uh, Emma, Aidan O'Brien, I think seeking his 10th victory, isn't it, in, in, in this race? Uh, are you with the uh, the, the Coolmore representative? Uh, this is probably shaping up to be one of the most interesting races of the week, just kind of based on the, the drama around the clock, I suppose. There was a big debate kind of um, kind of brought up on social media in the last few days. Um, Asadna is obviously the time, the time she's put up our. Uh, kind of bringing everyone's attention to to him sorry um but yeah I start off at Rip and kind of hard to judge it too much look it's kind of it's kind of, it's a hard one to to judge um I like River Tyro as well he, he was very impressive last time at Nice and I think the former dad is going to hold up quite well because I think they think quite a bit of the horse of uh, Joe Lyons as he was in behind him that day as well so but look outside of the top two I think it's not really a race that favours do too well in so I'm probably going to take them on a bit with um give me the beef boys for Jessica Harrington Frankie de Tori's very eye-catching jockey booking and I was very impressed when he beat Noche Magica of Paddy Toomey's who was quite highly touted coming into that race last time at the Cora so I think with any kind of improvement on that he'll be right up there as well maybe one who's a bit forgotten in the market so that's probably who I'm going to go with. Now, Stephen, I know you had a lot of sun yesterday, and I, I, I've just um, I'm privy to what you're tipping on this show. Uh, let me just get this right: we have got a 22 runner, six furlong race for two year olds, and you are weighing in uh, with your best bet on the cards with the 158 Irish trained River Tiber in the commentary. I, I, you have turned over a new leaf. This is phenomenal. No, I, I think um, ex explain I think more. Absolute explain good more. Thing. Well. Right. I think he's got one really rock solid form. The six furlongs is the key. You're getting a good price because he was very workmanlike in winning uh, last time on quite quick or goodish ground last time. He, he looked in trouble two furlongs out, but he picked up really strongly. Uh, and he, the sixth furlong, which he won on in his debut, is the key. Uh, I think he's held in the highest regard at home. I, I think you'll find, I mean, I, I looked at the exchanges this morning before doing the show. It, he's nudging two to one now on the exchanges. Mm. I think that price might be getting a bit of help to put it politely. And I suspect he'll end up being nearer even money tomorrow rather than two to one uh, when the heavy mob have played. I'm hoping they do play because I think he's a fantastic price now, two to one. A, a Sadner uh, beat a horse by 12 lengths of Ripon who's come out and got beaten even further at Epsom, beat the ambulance home at Epsom. That form isn't worth a fiver. Only worry about time when you're serving it. <laughs> I don't fancy a Sadner at all. Right, I, I like that. The Sadner is to I'll, lay a Sadner. I'll hold place, you to that. To <laughs> yeah, well, no, no. I've watched a lot of We've all watched races, all opinions, isn't it? But I think a Sadner is a very bad price, a very bad price. But I, I could be wrong. I'd probably sooner lay a Sadner at sort of evens to be in the first three than I would to lay it win only because it could be a freak. Obviously, it's clocked a fantastic time, all the rest of it. Uh, but I think River Tiber's got solid form, trained by a genius. Definitely want six fun. The one thing I say, say about George Bowie, very good trainer. His horses are usually 100% fit first time out and they don't improve. And a lot of them go backwards, in my opinion. So we'll see. Well, here, here was me thinking the Coventry, we're going to have a whole host of uh, each way plays. Uh, yep, yeah, it's between those at the top of the market. Look no further than the first and second favourites. Again, the panel split here between River Tiber uh, and the Sander in that group two at 305 right on to the king stand uh we're coming back a furlong now for this group one action five furlong sprint this will be fast and furious highfield princess heads the market five to two uh coon and getter 
Uh, nine to two, uh, best price available. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, about that representative there uh, for the the team Australia and Manakan five to one dramatized sevens cannonball twelves and we're going sixteens bar uh, Stephen uh, any view on this one or one you're happy to sit out? No, I'm looking to be a bookmaker here. I quite fancy being against Highfield Princess. I don't think she's absolutely certain to come forward that much for a return, which was obviously promising. She's got loads of pace, but I think five to two in a race of this nature is very short dramatised one at Haydock the other day where only one horse could win the race because he got the solo on the stands rail, which is about 10 yards faster than anywhere else on the track. So I think that one might be a little bit underpriced, perhaps. I've, I've gone for one here down the bottom. Um, let's see, I'm just trying to find it, make sure it's actually running. Um, Twilight Calls of Henry Candy. Now, mm, he's, been a, yeah. he's, a, he's a very, very good horse, this, on his day. He's run two moderate races so far this season. But if you watch them back, First time out, he was very well fancied and he got squeezed out of the stalls. And I think you can forget that run. He was immediately in a poor position. And last time, it was just a joke race um, from where he was on the track. He had no chance at Haydock behind Dramatised. Um, Ryan Moore's on, replacing Connor Beasley. That's a plus. He's 20 to 1 Twilight calls. Now, Henry Candy hasn't really got going this season, but he has had two winners from his last six runners in the last 14 days. 20 to 1 Twilight calls in a tricky race. Uh, I think he's quite a good bet. Yeah, uh, he was runner-up last year, wasn't he, behind the, uh, yeah. the emphatic nature strip. As you say, if you could return to that form, uh, he'd be a major player. Johnny, anything for you? Um, it's tough, Ed. I mean, I, I'm going to go for one at a price here. Um, I'd agree with, with the relation to Dramatise being flattered the last year. For all that, I think she's going to be trained for this. Um, probably do the same thing as last year, go down the Breeders' Cup route. I'm going to go with last year's Coventry uh, winner, Bradzell, who, to be fair, does have to pick up on form. He wasn't great behind Little Big Bear the last day, and you could say that hopes rest him um, wanting the five furlongs at this stage mm. of his career. Maybe he got away with it a little bit in the Coventry because of his class. But to be fair, he's not really finishing out his races over six. Holly Doyle rise, he's 33 to one. He obviously likes Ascot mm. um, and off a, you know, I, I think they'll be able to kind of ride him whatever way they want over this trip. Keep an eye out for Moonista as well. Um, she was with um, Jack Davison and I imagine she was bought by Connections. Jack's mother, I think, bred this mare and they would have had her as a broodmare prospect. So she was probably bought by, by Connections um, as, a, as a kind of a prospect for stroll down the line. And I know she was very disappointed behind uh, Laddie's church the last year. He was obviously going to Royal Ascot as well. But if she does bounce back to her form and Joseph could eke out a bit of improvement um, considering her back form, uh, at, even at this level, she could definitely place at a big price. But I'm going to go with another at a big price in Bradsell. Absolutely. I am all over the Bradsell. I think Bradsell's a monster price. Um, you watched that uh, Haydock race last time out. Tanked through the race and then just fell in a hole. Coming back to five furlongs, I think could be the making of Brad Sell. Of as you say, did win the commentary over six last year, but uh, uh, show plenty of early dash. Uh, Emma, anything for you? Yeah, it's kind of a tricky one again. Um, I see Princess, which is probably my favourite, but there's plenty of strong appeal. The runners always do quite well in this. Um, so the, the Australian filly Kulangata is obviously an intriguing one. Um, Look, and it was won by an Aussie sprinter last year, so you'd have to respect their rating party. I think they have another one, Cannonball is in there as well, um, another Australian sprinter. So, look, it's kind of, you have to respect them, but I, I'd find it hard to fence him too much myself just because I wouldn't have any kind of okay. gauge in the form, really. Um, but I'm going to go with Steve as well. Twilight Calls was one that kind of uh, gra caught my eye as well, second in this last year to nat Nature Strip. Form this year probably needs a bit to the imagination, but as Stephen was saying, there's excuses for those runs. And if he bounces back, he he won't be too far away at all. The yard is hitting a small bit of purple patch, like Stephen was saying. So around 18 to 1, he's probably not a bad bet. Okay, okay. So some each way value in this race. Uh, we'll stick with you, Emma, uh, for the 420, the Group 1 St. James's Palace Stakes. Well, this is becoming a little bit of a uh, an England versus Ireland, inverted commas, Chaldean Paddington. The Battle of the Guineas winners, uh, nine to four, uh, the pair of them uh, uh, across the board of many firms. Uh, which side of the fence you want? I mean, do you think Paddington gets the job done here? Chaldean arguably uh, sets the, I'd argue, slightly higher standard. Paddington still, I, in my view, a, a, an unknown quantity. Uh, you know, was thrown in the deep end last time out, got the job done. Uh, I think it's an exciting matchup, this. 
Yeah, no, it's it's definitely an exciting one. Getting um, two Guineas winners facing off is always going to be um, a good showdown. So, but like, if you're kind of looking at the straight Guineas. If you put a line through Hoy Royale, who was kind of beaten about two lengths by Sheldon and about by Paddington, there isn't a whole pile in it. But I'd probably, I'd probably going to edge with Paddington for this one, to be honest. Um, I just think he looks like um, more of an improver than Sheldon. Sheldon is, looks very straightforward. He does his job very well. But I just think Paddington looked a bit more green when he's guineas. And with any kind of improvement at all, I'd say there could be, there could be, um, there could be a big performance to come out of him here, trained by Aidan O'Brien. Ridden by Genius Ryan Moore, I, I just kind of I, I find it hard to see past him. Look two to one, taking on an English Guineas winner is probably short enough, but I think he could be a fairly kind of special horse. Naden talked about him like he could have been after he won the Guineas as well. He kind of proved he can go on any kind of ground as well. So I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with Paddington in this one. I think. Okay, Stephen, um, you think it lies between the market leaders, or do you see a potential boil over here? No, I can see them getting them beat here. I must admit. I mean, I like Chaldean as a horse. He, they, they, the Baldings love him, and he did a sort of turn in the in the two thousand guineas. But that was on soft ground. He does go on decent ground, but he did have a very hard race. The second, third, and fourth have all been beaten since. And I, I sort of feel like Paddington. I'm not sure that was the most wonderful race. I was going to ask uh, Johnny and Emma what they thought about Paddington on fast ground because for, he won on good last. I'm all of his previous wins are on testing ground and. The only time he got beat was at Ascot on good ground. Now, it was first time out. He probably needed the run. And he obviously a different model now. I just got in the back of my mind, I wonder if he might be tapped for a bit of pace. And I've gone for, as a result, uh, Sequeiro's gift of uh, Charlie Hills, who's having a good season. I was re It was only a sort of listed handicap top hat. It was, that form is not good enough, Sequeiro's, as it stands. But the way he did it, I mean, he didn't really settle. He absolutely sprinted clear when they asked him for an effort. He's got a proper turn of foot. And at the back of my mind, I just don't think Chaldine or Paddington have got a turn of foot. Now, it might not be that sort of race. It'll be a truly run race. And maybe Sequeira's gift won't be good enough. But five, six to one, I think you're entitled to take a chance. OK, taking on the, the big guns there, Stephen. Uh, Johnny, any view on this one? Yeah, I, I'm taking them on as well. Um... The, the, the Paddington thing on the ground is definitely a small concern because this is proper quick round. I, I wouldn't be too worried about the fact that, you know, he was beaten for some out necessarily, but all we can go on is what we have and the fact that he's basically run on good or softer since. And, um, you know, what can you say about the, the Irish guineas? Did he show that he has a sort of a collateral edge over Chaldean or did he show that maybe the new market form wasn't that great with the two horses there disappointing on the day? I know he wasn't, he wasn't that well touted. What, you know, going into the season, I suppose he wasn't even on the new market ticket. It was interesting at the Curra as well. He went from nine to four out to three to one, so there didn't seem to be much confidence behind him. He produced a good performance, but for me, I I really like uh, Mustabshire here, um, and I I was just minded to look back on Handassa. This this horse's dam. I remember Kevin Prendergast trained her, and um, she was by Dubawi, but she's been absolutely brilliant at Stud. Now he did disappoint at Newmarket, but his performance the last day at York. William Bewey came in and basically said this horse is quick and twice here. It was an extra extraordinary performance the turn of foot he showed when they stacked up in behind him just coming into the sort of the last four long and a half now i know this is a far far tougher race and john gosling said afterwards he wasn't exactly sure where they were going to go with him but they pitched him in here you can get nine to one this morning on him and um, he's from an exceptional family of horses by dark angel he looks very very good and i i just think at the prices you can definitely make a case for taking on the top two who i'm I'm just not sure Paddington is a star and, 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 you know, that reference to the ground is another potential concern. But I think this is a very, very good horse, potentially, and he should be well up to this level. Yeah, fascinating. The general consensus is to look elsewhere, uh, apart from the top of the market. Um, top of the market is where we're going to begin uh, in the five o'clock. The Ascot Stakes bring on the Knights, of course, was runner up in this last year when he was absolutely smashed up in the betting um, I think he went off three to one favourite, didn't he, <coughs> on the day in this 20 runner field. Uh, fourth to Constitution Hill in last year's Supreme. There we go. I wanted to get my Cheltenham Festival reference in. There's the collateral <laughs> form line. There's the collateral <laughs> form lines for you. Um, anyway, uh, bring on the night, though. He's seven to four this time round, uh, Stephen. Uh, I mean, do you think he's, I mean, how do you sum him up? I, I couldn't quite work it out, really, whether he's a, a good two to one, a lay or just a race. I'm, I'm happy to, at the end of it all, just I'm happy to sit this one out, I think. Yeah, he's one of those, isn't it? Don't don't forget, all these markets are priced up basically in the dark. There's no exchange guidance on them. So it's basically people who work for the big few bookmakers 
having a guess up and all copying each other. So this is a very hard horse to price up. He's been off for uh, 371 days. Uh, so he could be fully primed. Since Everything's race, gone well. Yeah, yeah. Laid out for this race again. Stable nap, six to four favourite. He could also have had a lot of problems. It's very quick ground. He hasn't run for a year. It could be five to one. We don't know. He's an exchange mm. horse. Facet. The one I thought was interesting, I can't pretend it's going to be a betting race, particularly for me, but uh, calling the wind, Richard Hughes, uh, obviously not got millions of horses. He's had five winners in the last 14 days. They're suddenly flying and they've been very quiet. So I quite like things like that. Calling the wind's had a couple of sighters. Last time out, soft ground in the Chester Cup. He ran a perfectly respectable race, ridden by Spencer. He's now got a jockey on Billy Lochnane, who takes off three pounds. It's the greatest jockey uplift in history, this. Calling the win, load of out, loads of our Scott form, a smooth traveller with a turn of foot. He doesn't win many races, calling the win, but I think he'll run really well. OK, calling the wind each way for Stephen um, in the five o'clock with the uh, greatest jockey uplift ever. <laughs> uh, right, OK. Uh, Johnny, uh, bring on the night. Uh, yes or no? Definitely no. Um, I mean, I, 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 I'm big on pedigrees and I was mad against this horse last year on the basis that he's by Glen Eagles. Uh, he's stepping up to two and a half miles. This surely isn't his trip on uh, pedigree. Now, in fairness, you couldn't say he didn't get the trip, but if you no, watch just on, at the, yeah. the, the, the close, he stayed on. But if you watch the closing yeah. stages of the race, so he comes up upsides called train you think he's going to get there he doesn't and then just at the closing stages the last sort of 50 yards arcadian sunrise is actually gaining on him his stamina is actually running out at the line right now as steve says he hasn't run since he's actually four pounds higher um and he doesn't have a great draw in 15 so for me i like i know willie mullins trains him but like it's not straightforward to produce a horse to win a royal ascot off another year off so it's like mm -hmm. it, you know for me that's that's um that's a negative, but he is making the market for everyone else. And I went through the sort of the alternatives uh, this morning, and the only negative you have about Law of the Sea is, but he's David Egan is riding him. The Chester Cup run was just really, really eye catching, and you know that was the sort of performance that for me would be crying out. He, this horse is absolutely perfect for this race. Touched off at Haydock. There was no real disgrace in that. He didn't do much wrong and steps up to this trip. Now the, the key for Egan is going to be to slot him in from gate seventeen. That's going to be tricky. But on the Chester run, um, going a little bit further here, I think he's a massive chance he gets into any sort of a rhythm off two pound higher. Right, fascinated. Each way play the lure of the sea. Horse number seventeen on your cards. Say David Egan and Ian Williams uh, combining, just looking for the best price. Eleven to one, eleven to one, the best price uh, on offer. Obviously, Stephen always says uh, check your each way concessions as well. Uh, Emma Willie Mullins, train favourite, surely so someone's got to convince us. Are you with Bring on the Night, or are we we swerving this one too? I, I probably won't have a bet in this one, to be honest. It's, it's, a, it's a tough one. Like, ah. Willie has, has, has trained four winners of it, but, like, he's, he's just too short to be back in, really. Like, um, it's yeah. a tough race. Like, kind of one that would be, I'd be slightly drawn to maybe a horse with no name back on the flat again, uh, first time since finishing fifth in Cesaro, which uh, apparently she's in full, so maybe that might bring out a little bit of improvement in her. But, look, really, I'm probably going to leave this one go, to be honest. Yeah, let, 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 let that one go and we'll move on to the 5.35 and uh, the Wolfton Stakes listed action uh, over the 10 furlongs uh, saga. Uh, your 72 market leader, what looks a, a wide open field here, uh, Stephen, I think it's fair to say. Uh, I was going through this, the 16 runners, I thought you could make a case quite seriously for about a dozen of them. So um, yeah. a, a tricky one. I, 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 I was actually, funny enough, uh, with uh, I know Nico de Boinville is your favourite jockey and Jamie Spencer oh. is your second favourite. So, yeah, I, oh. I was actually with, I thought, Spencer uh, for the Christopher team here on Poker Face, uh, also for Lady mm. Gaga fans. I thought um, could easily run a big race here. Wasn't beat far by Point Lonsdale uh, at Chester last time out. And I thought returned to a bit of better ground. I could see that would go well around the, the 12 to 1 mark. But, uh, yeah, tricky old race to sum up, isn't it? Yeah, very hard. Not punter friendly, is it? 16 runner listed contest. So the terms are not in your favour to play each way unless you can find concessions. I, I thought Saga you might go for, it, Ed, the, the, the firm you go on your holidays with. But I think Saga is a rogue. I mean, he's run 10 right. times. He's finished second <coughs> on five occasions. Um, and he's very tricky. I thought he half jacked it. Uh, I think it was in the Britannia, wasn't it? Uh, in the first time Blinkers and Tongue Tie last season, I thought he should have won. And 
he's going to be a favourite. You're going to have to. I, I'm sort of determined this week. If the Tory yeah. rides winners, I'm going to have to be doing my money because I think they're all going to be underpriced. Obviously, there's going to be a Over huge that, yeah. public yeah, yeah, following yeah. for them, and I, and I think Saga is probably around four to one. Far, far, far too short in a race where you can make a case for about ten of them. I think. Right. Okay. Yep. Uh, and Johnny, uh, are you on that viewpoint here? I mean, this is a race you're just happy to sit out, or do you have a strong fancy? Oh, we've lost Johnny. We've lost you, Johnny. Hang on. I you think he there, might be well knit. Ah. Sorry, I actually Sorry. there was a noise outside, yeah. so I muted myself. One sec. Okay. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think Steve might be touching on something here in terms of the horse being quite well named in Saga because of a succession of defeats. But if I mean, I'm just looking around here. Some bookmakers are paying five places, and it's very very hard to see him not being thereabouts. Okay. In, I, I, you could say at Newmarket that he jacked it in, but like the ground he made up from that traffic that he met. I mean, he he was he was definitely delayed more than a head behind King of Conquest. Obviously the you're talking about a, a head ver, a verdict at the line and he's better off the weight here and he was definitely the better horse in the day in terms of um the visual impression anyway um he's stepping up to 10 furlongs here but i think frankie's going to cover him up cover him up cover him up come with that later on he obviously likes the track um and i i think he's going to be there about there might be that slight proviso about what he'll find interesting to see how Bolshoi ballet gets on he hasn't been placed mm. in what half a dozen runs or so now but he was my idea with the derby winner back in the day and uh, you know he's running fairness at Newbury wasn't bad. I think he's going to run well, but I like Saga with the each way angle. I, I think he's he's going to be the last horse off the bridle and hopefully the last horse um, to uh, get there on the line as well. Yeah, I, I tip Bolshoi Ballet on this show for the Derby. Um, yeah, <laughs> and not not again since. <laughs> I have to add. Right, go on. Let's let's get on to the finale. The six ten. The Copper Horse Handicap. The absolute nap of all naps runs in this. We all know where we're going. Triumph hurdle winner running an absolute donkey race. Uh, let's put it bluntly. The Copper Horse Handicap. See you later, Alligator. I know Emma's weighing in on this one. The Mighty Vauban, 13 to 8. Ryan Moore, Willie Mullins. That is the end of the show, ladies and gents. Um, yeah, Emma, you, you must be with me here. Vauban, yes or no? Yes, yeah. Vauban, definitely. Yeah. I, I stayed away from Willie's first ones because I said I couldn't back two Willie horses in the first day of Royal Ascot. It would be a bit too much. <laughs> so I'm gonna, no, I, I would. Look, Vauban kind of had a funny year this year. Like he hasn't done anything on the flat really, of, um, but like he's he's just such a talented horse. And Willie's always been kind of hinting at a flat campaign, kind of hinting towards the Melbourne Cup. So maybe this might kind of help him out, uh, kind of a first step on the road. Um, just a very good horse. I don't want, there's not a whole point in here that I'd be too worried about um, with him. Roy Moore rides him, yeah. So there's no negatives to me all on Vauban. Yeah, I mean, emotion aside, I mean, seriously, he was a listed winner on the flat before he joined Willie Mullins. Uh, he's off 101. He's got to be better than 101, hasn't he? Johnny, as, as a flat horse here, I mean, stamina's not going to be a problem. Ground, I don't see a problem. There's a lot of exposed handicappers in against him. Uh, in, in my view, I, I actually thought he'd be shorter than, I mean, pushing two to one in, in a few places. Why does Willie run absurd? You know, this is the thing. I mean, the, I, I was kind of half keen to lay this horse. I think I might even have laid him at Killarney. Um, he was going over two and a half miles. He was a very short price. Unbelievable market confidence in him. Um, and he just travelled like a really good horse in the race. And you can't compare beating Emily Roebling. And I think it was the third favourite, second or third favourite in the race. Um flopped as well the form sort of yeah the form was was maybe not great but he traveled like a really good horse frankie de Tory is riding him and it's kind of just a price angle for me I, obviously i i mean the, the the interesting thing about voban was as soon as this horse was winning the triumph hurdle they were talking about either a melbourne cup or royal last they must have been very confident in what he was showing at home that he was a flat tie yeah. and they've had plenty of them in recent times but absurd i i was just like he was sent off two to seven at killarney it wasn't a terrible race on on the day um he traveled like an absolute beast in it and at the prices you're getting sixes about a willy horse in this race under frankie de Tory. um just looking at my each way terms here and you're getting five play yeah. five places five places yeah. across the board love that each way I love it. That's the, that's the the proper account closer, isn't it? The six to one <laughs> schneer uh, each way. I know. do like it, but uh, yeah. My my point was Vauban seven to four. Bring on the night seven to four. Uh, I thought Vauban had uh, far few questions to answer compared to 
his, his stable mate who runs in, in the race earlier. That was just my opinion on that one. Uh, Stephen, uh, you with the um, the the horse who's fourth in this year's champion hurdle, or are you looking elsewhere? I th I think he's. I've tipped him a few times over jumps. I've been fairly disappointed with him this season. I think I think Emma's right there. And Ed, these are the conditions he's run under: yielding, soft, yielding, soft, yielding, good to soft. Yielding heavy, then in France, soft, soft, soft. He ran on so good on his known. debut. Yeah. Yeah. Which yeah. It's going to be firm ground. It's 10 past six, unless they get thunders. I mean, <laughs> if they get a massive thunderstorm, he could be an absolute certainty, couldn't he, off the mark? <laughs> but firm ground, he's, I don't know. I mean, we thought he had a lot of speed when he won the Triumph Hurdle, but that was on, you know, firm ground at Ascot, 10 past six. It could be okay. properly quick, couldn't it? Who, who you take, uh, who are you taking sure. him on with it? Yeah, I, I thought that Johnny's touched on the interesting one, and and the fact that Willie runs him and has booked the Tory. I mean, it, it it's a very strange, isn't it? If the favourite was a certainty, you wouldn't think he'd be running something else. So interesting to see how Val Vauban goes in the market. He's, a, I, I can see the case for him that he looks chucked in, but on firm ground, I think I'd have to lean against him. Okay, right. We we are split there then. I mean, in the finale, the uh, could quite literally could be the get out of jail stakes. Uh, but at the time it comes round to ten past six. Uh, right, it's it's fascinating racing. It's brilliant. Now it's time to nail uh, the colours to the mast. Um, we'll go in screen order as I see it. Uh, Stephen, can I have your nap uh, of Royal Ascot Tuesday, please, and your next best? Yep. Uh, three oh five River Tiber. He's he's nudging two to one now. I think that's a fantastic price and well worth taking. I think you'll yep. be a lot shorter by the time the heavy mob have played. And my next best would be Sequeiro's Gift, who's around six to one in the four twenty. I think you, the front two are vulnerable there, and I'm just hoping Sequeiro's Gift can handle the jump up in class. Johnny Ward. Yeah, I'll go uh, with my nap as a top and top and bottom nap, um, and next best absurd is the nap in the last, and the <coughs> games the next best in the first. And which ones? Did you say who did the first? Sorry, modern games. Modern games in the first, yeah. Modern games in the Queen and and Emma. My nap it will be Buckaroo in the Wolverton Stakes, and my next best will be Vauban in the Copper Horse. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm I'm napping up the Vauban. Um, I'm gonna get my Rich Richie tie on, and uh, I think Brad Sal is is a monster price. Uh, drop it back to five furlongs. That's in the uh, the King Stand, which is at three forty. Holly Doyle, Archie Watson, each way at 33 to 1. Well, many thanks uh, for watching the day one preview of Royal Ascot here on irishracing.com. Of course, don't forget uh, to check out irishracing.com for all the latest news, views, features and all things that are going on. Uh, what should be a spectacular day of action. Stay tuned. We'll be bringing you day-by-day uh, -day previews of best bets for the rest of the week. So see you again soon.